This is the Horse Radio Network. I'm Stacy Westfall, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show, the Western Dressage Edition. This is episode 577. The topic of this podcast is straightness and collection. Ida Norris joins me for the judge's view, and Suzanne Morrissey joins me for the trainer's tip. But before we dive into those interviews, Diney Swanson from the Western Dressage Association of America is here with me to discuss the WDAA point system for earning awards. Hi, Diney. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I am doing well. Before we even jump into the point system, I have to say I went to a show. I went down to the Kentucky show, so I was able to show in the AQHA part and it was fun. So, but um, actually that kind of ties into this question because I haven't yet shown in an online Western dressage class. And what I'm interested to talk about today is the point system that the WDAA has and how that is different at different like shows versus online. So I guess I want to start with this question. Do Does the rider earn points or does the horse earn points or a combination? Well, that's what's awesome about our points and awards program. It's the, we call it World PAP just for short because it is the WDAA Horse Lifetime Points and Awards Program. (laughs) Okay. And it rewards the horse. Okay. Throughout their journey in Western dressage. So it is not a race. It's a journey. Mm -hmm. It's not year end. This is, this goes on forever. Okay. Um, And you earn, you know, different levels throughout, um, throughout the whole program. Uh, There are there's register of merit, register of achievement, regist- register of excellence. And then we move into the the um, medals. So there's bronze medal, silver medal, gold medal, and then supreme champion. And mm-hmm. to get to supreme champion, it's, it's a lot of hard work. Um, it requires 700 points and at least five of those tests submitted uh, for points have to be uh, from level four or higher when we, you know, get on to level five and level six. So it, you know, you can't rack up all your points in intro or basic. It, it's, it's a progression through all the levels. Okay. Um, and you said, is there a difference between how you earn points, like online points versus yeah. different shows? How does that so work? So that, that's why I was, I was trying to look up our chart here. Um, mm. So, For an online show, we award half points. Um, For a USCF licensed show, we award two points, double points. For our world show that takes place in Guthrie, that's three points. And I skipped over one point, a a WDAA recognized show earns one point. So So do you happen to know? That's a progression also. Okay. So where are these points coming from? Are they above a certain test score? You have to score, you have to score over a 60 to be able to submit points uh, or to, you know, to be able to submit a, uh, your, that class for points. And it's a kind of a rolling scale where if you're showing in intro and you get a 60, you, you might get one point. If you show level four and you get a 75 and you're at the world show, you could get a whole bunch of points. Okay. So it, it has, it kind of, has to do with a little bit of everything. So it's a little bit, so the AQHA version of the points that you're doing, I don't have it in front of me right now either, but it's, it's the same as ours. It's a similar idea, meaning so like our chart. Okay. 
And that would be actually, I think that charts the same as the traditional just dressage points that I was earning for AQHA too. Um, that sh- it should be a little bit more simple. Okay. Cause it was basically like, it was basically like, you know, a score of, you know, there was a score range and uh-huh. then the chart of which level you're in first, second, third, fourth level, and then the show right. rate in the range. So it makes more sense. I'll have to, um, get a link from you to put in the show notes of this so that we can see the point system. But the, um, boy, it looks like the online classes have been popular. I did an interview with Lynn Palm the other day and she said she judged 85 Western dressage tests for one show. Uh, yeah, we've had almost 40 online shows recognized by WBAA. Um, that has spurred a huge interest in our points program. Um, I did want to point out the points program is not mandatory. It's your choice if you want to uh, participate or not. Um, and we do award extremely nice, extremely high quality awards um, for all the levels earned. Um, it's going to, you know, it's going to be a little slower with the online shows because they're worth half as much as as a regular in-person show Mm -hmm. um but we felt that we needed to you know uh, offer just a little bit lower point factor due to the fact that you know it's not in person and it's not the same as um you know being right there with the judge Mm -hmm. um so it's we we've we it's just been phenomenal the uh the reception that we've had for these Mm -hmm. online shows and it's really gotten a lot of new people involved. Yeah. I, I like, I also like the points programs that are um, where it feels a little bit more like you're competing with yourself because you basically, you, you mark the score, you earn that score and then that score score earned you points. And then, like you said, unlike a year end title where only one person can earn it when you have a point system like this, it's like, it's like anybody who reaches that bar gets that award uh-huh. and that could be one person or that could be a hundred people or, it, you know, there's not a limit to, there's not a limit to it. And so we do some of that in a couple of the different, um, reigning, reigning classes that we do. And it work, it really encourages people to get out there and get busy because yeah, they want to really earn fun. their belt buckles. So, yeah. Well, thank you for joining me. Is there anything else you want to review before we go? Or do you think we've pretty much covered the points? I think we've covered the points. Just go to www.westerndressageassociation.org and look under uh, Horse Lifetime Points and Awards Program. And it's, it's all there. There's a lot of information. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Thank you. This Nutrition Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, the company that simplifies your search for research-proven nutritional supplements at kppusa.com. The horse that matters to you matters to Kentucky Performance Products. Electrolytes. Who needs them? Your horse, that's who. Electrolytes perform critical functions within your horse's body. They help regulate nerve and muscle functions by carrying electrical impulses between cells. In addition, electrolytes assist the body in maintaining a healthy fluid balance by controlling your horse's desire to drink. When your horse loses significant amounts of electrolytes and fluids, problems such as dehydration, muscle cramping, fatigue, tying up, and colic may occur. Even in mild forms, these conditions can have a negative impact on your horse's ability to perform and recover after exercise. Top riders and veterinarians turn to Summer Games Electrolyte to keep their horse healthy in hot weather, and you can too. Summer Games replenishes the electrolytes and trace minerals lost when your horse sweats, and it stimulates the thirst response so your horse continues to drink and stay properly hydrated. So when the going gets hot, trust Summer Games Electrolyte from Kentucky Performance Products to protect your horse. This Nutritional Minute has been brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of their terrific products at kppusa.com. Joining me today for the judges' view is Ida Norris. Ida judges both Western and traditional dressage, and she is a USEF 
S judge for traditional, and she's a USEF small R judge in the Western dressage world. Ida has had a lifelong interest in Western events, and I'm jealous she's done working equitation. And she's originally from the same state that I am, the state of Maine. So thank you so much for joining me today, Ida. I'm so excited to be with you. Thanks for asking me, Stacy. Well, what I would love to discuss with you today is kind of the top of the training pyramid, which is straightness and collection. And I've been going like one rung at a time, but what I've noticed is that it's harder and harder as we get higher up to tease those as to separate pieces because they kind of all tie together. So what I would love to know from you today is how straightness and collection, how that is seen from the judge's point of view, anything you can tell us about the scoring or the expectations as the horse moves up the level, like kind of educate me please on this subject. Well, I thank you. And you know how it is. We could write books, but I will um, hit the highlights and then you're going to jump in and uh, help me explain all of this. So thank you. (laughs) Um, Yes. Okay. Well, let's get a quick review. Um, Rhythm, of course, is first on uh, on the pyramid and that's clear gait that the horse is in a walk track lope, walk jog lope, walk is four beat, jog is two beat, lope is three beat. We have to absolutely keep the rhythm. Relaxation and suppleness is the idea that the horse is emotionally and physically relaxed enough that his muscles will work with you. And riders and trainers and judges are always looking at horses and saying, you know, there are a number of things which affect relaxation and suppleness, and that can be environment, it can be pain, um, it can be anxiety. So we're always looking for horses to look confident and relaxed enough. The muscles are soft enough, not stressed to actually perform, and this shows up in competitions. You can see that clearly, and we see it when we're training, of course. The next aspect is contact, and contact, well, you want to take up your reins. And, oh, my goodness, I need to steer. Uh, I need to have halt. I need to direct the horse. And that acceptance of the rein, which begins even in intro level of WD, is very important because that's our steering, that's the horse being willing to give to the bridle, give it the pole, give it the jaw. And we don't talk about it in this way very much necessarily, except that when you go into the higher levels, you see on the bit. Oh, that scary phrase, is the horse on the bit? Hmm. And they don't mean leaning on the bit, but they mean, is the horse responsive to the bit and will it close its pole, i.e., is it willing for its face to come more vertical? Will it arch its neck? As you ride forward into your elastic contact, can you begin to arrange with the horse, hey, I'd like you to stretch forward. I'd like you to stretch out. I would like you to uh, come into a shorter neck frame so that I can negotiate a tighter turn. So that contact becomes i.e. putting the horse on the bed or other divisions talk about setting his head, a frame. There's a lot of words that we use, euphemisms, mm-hmm. for putting a horse on the bed. But, but that's the contact. Impulsion is the next part, which is the capability of thrust. And that's, you know, at training level and basic, it says, does the horse go freely forward? And at level one and first level in regular dressage, it says, does the horse stay in continuous impulsion in front of the rider's leg? Is it willing to keep going while you're steering? It keeps the same tempo. It keeps forward. Those, All of those four things ahead of straightening and collection become very important because if those don't work for the rider, then straightening, which is next on the tree, and i.e., it says straightening, but the bug in the room or the elephant in the room is bending. <laughs> and that's that everybody's like, oh, no. Um, it said, you know, lack bend, didn't have enough bend in the corner, in the, in the circle. So I want to talk first about bend and then go right from that to all of those five things, make engagement and collection. So great. if that's okay with you, I'll go on with that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. All right. So straightness. It's really easy to simply think about straightness like you think about, okay, I saw my friend come down the center line and even I've taught many, many husbands to help us with center lines, like get your husband to help you. You know, horse, non-horse people 
can figure out straightness, no problem. Get your husband to stand at sea and say, hey, is the horse absolutely straight from head to tail? Mm -hmm. Are his ears level? Because if the horse's ears are level, the face hangs perpendicular to the ground, which means there's no tilt. And you're looking, an uneducated person can look at a horse and say, hey, he's bisected on the line of C. He travels absolutely straight. His haunches aren't out. His shoulders aren't bulging. His stomach isn't sticking out somewhere. So straight on a straight line is easy for a person to think about. Mm -hmm. The second part of straightness is way harder. And that is what we talk about when we begin to get into how are we going to teach a horse to engage, to take weight behind? And that means we're going to have to be supple in bend and corners and circles and lateral work. So that works like this. As you track around a corner or a circle, in our minds, in human minds, we're thinking that you look at a circle and you see the arc. And to make a perfect circle, the arc of a circle is always the same. And if you were drawing this with your hand and one side bulged, and mine does because I'm really bad at drawing, <laughs> <laughs> so mine always look old. But, you know, if that arc remains exactly the same, then that circle is a perfect circle. So for a judge and for trainers and riders, the interesting thing is, is we imagine in our mind that when we set a horse at basic and at intro, a 20 meter circle, we're imagining that the horse's spine, and if we took an x-ray down from the top, that his spine would go around just like a Chiquita banana, and his whole spine right <laughs> around the top would just bend on the same arc uh -huh. as a circle. But unfortunately, horses anatomically are incapable of doing this. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that our brains as judges think that this happens, but we're trained for five places that we're to observe bend. And as riders, you're actually a you're actually amazingly making these circles even. People are actually able to make these circles even, but the horse anatomically actually doesn't work like that. So I wanted to quickly review anatomically how the horse works to point out to you that when you're trying to bend, what I'm looking at on the horse. Yeah, that's great. I'm curious. So I have a quick mem mnemonic, which is five points, and we teach like 4-Hers and kids and stuff and uh, amateur adults this, but head rotation, neck bend, shoulder rotation, body position, hip rotation. Now, it isn't anatomically exactly correct. It's a mnemonic to help us remember the five places that we're going to look for this. So a horse's head, and let's say its skull, butts right up to atlas and axis. It doesn't actually hang over it. Its occiput does not hang over um, its first uh, C1. It doesn't hang over C1. It butts straight up to it, which means that a horse can turn its head. He can have his face on the vertical to you, and he can rotate his head about the way E.T. used to in the movie, or, you know, <laughs> in that movie, the girl could turn her head all around. And a horse can do that, or he can tilt his nose left and his ears right, which is called tilting. And on a test, when you get a test back that says lax bend or lax pole positioning or lax lateral flexion, lax lateral pole flexion, this mm -hmm. is it. So, for example, when we do a turn on the forehand, um, part of the requirement of a turn on the forehand is that um, if the horse is moving away from the left leg, the rider, when it looks down, can see the horse's left eye, i.e., you had lateral pole flexion while you moved the horse away from the left leg. And this mm -hmm. is part, this is the, this is part of bend. One of the five places in a horse that he can exhibit bend. So lateral pole flexion. Now the neck is really simple. We're used to the horse, you know, being on the cross ties and we let the cross ties go and he turns his neck all the way around. And he's looking past his, his butt and you're thinking, Oh my goodness, he just turned his neck into a U. Uh -huh. <laughs> Horses do that. They can really bend their neck. And amazingly enough, when a judge says that a horse doesn't have a lot of bend, it's almost never neck bend that we're looking for. Mm. Because neck bend doesn't affect a horse's body, and it rarely displaces weight onto the hind legs. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So almost all of the exercises that we do have very marginal neck bend, although some it requires some. But unfortunately, a lot of times when we write on a test needs bend, riders get on and start moving around on the reins. And, well, I won't be PC. I'll just say we start hauling around on the reins. Mm-hmm. I used to do that. I didn't know. I didn't understand. Mm-hmm. And I'd pull on the rein and I would bend the horse's neck. And then the judge would say, "Neck, this is only neck bend. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm going to pull my hair out. I don't understand. But it's easy to think about neck bend because you know what that is. You can visually see it. But just mm-hmm. keep in mind, most of the exercises we're doing have very little neck bend required. Mm-hmm. So the next place you can see bend in a horse is through the scapulas or the withers. And the scapulas attach to the body, and they can flex up and down, and they can flex sideways. And if you imagine a front-wheel drive car, you have got it in your mind. Just imagine two tires right where his withers are, and you can flex them left and right. And when a horse goes around a corner, and especially a tight one, those shoulders flex. And so this is the idea why at second level, shoulder in is there, because Shoulders have to become more and more supple for bend, and they have to become more and more supple for uphill positioning because the withers not only go sideways, but they go up and down, and they help to lift up the trunk of the horse when we're trying to put more weight on the hind legs for engagement. And so shoulder in, and any exercise which flexes the shoulders, i.e. circles, serpentine, Those are all there in those first level and level one dressage, western dressage and dressage. Those are there because the shoulders have to become more supple and they are part of the bending exercises which prepare us for the collection that's coming. Mm. So about front wheel drive, that's your shoulders. Mm -hmm. And that front wheel drive is driven by your thighs and your seat. So for all those times that your riding instructor said, I want you to steer more off your seat and off your balance. That was it. That's what they're getting at. Now, next behind that is right where you sit over the horse, right over the girth, where the girth is, is the barrel of the horse, right under the rider. And the horse there can literally only bend three degrees. And Hillary Clayton in traditional dressage has done thousands of anatomical studies on horses, and she's really now become our bio um, biomechanical expert in the United States and has done so many studies on this and it's fascinating. But under your girth area and under your leg, you can sometimes feel the horse bulging out into your lower leg and you're like, he will not get off my leg as I turn the corner. And they can bulge under the girth area, what we call their body. And in the mnemonic, it said only body positioning because that is literally three degrees or less, there's some flexion there. Mm -hmm. Now, the last place is around the hips, but I want to mention the lumbar. And the lumbar are the three or four vertebrae that are right behind your saddle. And amazingly enough, those lumbar are able and capable of undulating up and down, but they cannot go sideways. And this is why on the circle, if we took the x-ray like we talked about before and you looked down on top of the x-ray as you Mm -hmm. rode around a circle, right behind the saddle is straight and you swear that the horse is on the arc of the circle and you would look down and you'd see his pole rotating, i.e. flexing left on a left circle. You'd see a tiny bit of neck bend. You'd see his shoulders looking like front wheel drive going around the turn. You'd see a little bit of flexing under where the rider actually sits right under the saddle. And then you go, wow, that's bizarre. The back is actually straight right behind the saddle. So then how does the horse compensate? How does the horse keep his hind legs tracking behind the front legs? How does that happen? Because his spine is straight there. Mm -hmm. And now comes what is seriously cool. And my husband's a race car driver. So he explains it to me mechanically like this. The SI, which is the jumper's bump behind, and the stifle, the hip, uh, the hips, the stifle, the SI, the hock, and the fetlock work in combination all together, all of those joints together, distributing weight behind like the differential on your pickup truck. 
and you can turn the real wheels, and the real wheels can bump up and down and jump over rocks and go through mud because one wheel can go down and one wheel can go up because your horse over his SI behind the saddle, that big jumper's bump that we talk about, is a flexing, balancing joint that's attached only by ligaments and tendons. And these four or five joints work all together to distribute weight and to tip the hips back and forth and forward and back in order to get around corners and distribute weight. And amazingly enough, when a horse engages, it doesn't engage weight onto the inside hind leg. As a horse turns, it actually puts more weight onto the outside leg so that the horse stands up and goes around the corners with weight more even on both hind legs together. Mm. And that's, that's what we're talking about with bend, but that becomes engagement. So to review bend, you can see bend in five places, the pole, the neck, the shoulders, i.e. withers. There's a very little bit of flexing through the rib cage. And do the hind legs track in the tracks that you ask them to, or do they track behind the front legs of the horse? So going back to the center line again, when the horse is absolutely straight and we want him straight on the center line, those hind legs have to track directly behind the front legs. And the judge from the front sees, like a railroad track, two sets of legs, just the front, if the hind legs are straight. The trick becomes, as you, as you progress through the levels and the exercises with the bending, you know, we have simple bending in basic and training level and intro. We have 20 meter circles and big turns, and there's a little bit of bending. And mostly that looks like, you know, a little bit of pull flexion to the inside, tiny neck bend if, if, if you can see it. The shoulders go around a little bit, the hind legs track, and there's a tiny little flexion, you know, through the barrel if everything's looking good. Mm -hmm. As you progress up the levels and you're asked for more complicated exercises like shoulder in, half path, People that are working on those movements and trainers and judges that are helping people with those movements, we begin to be more specific rather than just saying the horse lacks bend. We begin to point out to them exactly what part of the bend, i.e. suppleness, where in the body did the horse lack the bend suppleness that we were looking for in this particular exercise. Mm -hmm. And so now studying the rule book to really understand how much bend is required in a half pass, how much bend is required in a shoulder in, because each exercise or movement um, emphasizes various parts of the body that we're trying to show more bend or show less bend. They're not the same. Okay. Now, quick question. Like where do you, are there common themes that you see for problems in, when you're sitting there in the judge's chair watching? Like, is it common that when somebody's doing shoulder in, is there like a common mistake the riders make while yeah. riding the test? Sure, absolutely. Um, shoulder in is notorious for being more like leg yield, that they put the front end of the horse off the track and, and they're, they're trotting along on a, on a diagonal. And, you know, shoulder in describes that it'll be approximately 32 degree angle and we don't stick people with that we're not sitting there with a measuring tape but in order to get the average size horse into three tracks which is what shoulder and requires and this is one of the times where you need to be in the three tracks and if the shoulder blades don't show some flexion and the pole shows no flexion you can't you end up in four tracks at 32 degrees from the track, and that's leg yield. Mm. Because it's crossing all of the legs, moving sideways, and that's leg yield. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So shoulder in is that the hind legs track straight down the track, and the shoulders, so you, now you're beginning to go, oh, the shoulders have to bend, which means that three degrees of flexion in the body is going to be necessary those shoulders are going to rotate like front end drive, like there's no tomorrow. And there's going to be a little tiny bit of pull flexion to the left. 
And that is going to occur actually on the outside rain. Mm -hmm. So now studying how precisely each movement, what is the emphasis of the bending required for each movement is very sophisticated and becomes very important in the rider's training preparation for exhibition. Because what happens to them is they get into these tests where they have prepared the movement incorrectly. And if the movement doesn't meet the requirements, for example, shoulder in, if they are leg yielding, which means they're trotting and they're on the bit and they're going forward, I mean, they can be on the bit and in a nice frame and a fairly steady balance, but you don't actually have bend and three tracks, which is the requirement for this movement, then it's a four. Because mm-hmm. I don't, it's, it's really lovely that you're in collected trot and you're on the bit, but you didn't do the movement, so that's insufficient. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. It is. And so, and then I kind of lumped for this conversation, like the straightness and collection in between, in, in together. And it still mm-hmm. always cracks me up that whenever we talk about straightness, we end up talking about bend. It's, yeah. it, it's, it is, it's always funny. I understand why. And yet it's still, it's just funny to me. It, and so, um, so for collection, like, let's have fun with this and let's talk about all those movements that I watch on TV, but don't do yet. Cause <laughs> I watch them on TV and don't do them yet. So let's talk about some of them. So like when you, when you watch um, like a, like a really like, like a canter pirouette, let's just use that for fun because to okay. me, like, that's kind of like, I see it and I'm like, or, or one tempies, it doesn't matter. Those both look really, really fun. And so when you see that, how do you see straightness and collection illustrated in those movements? Okay. So here's the thing. One time changes, one tempies require on believable straightness Mm -hmm. because your timing aid for that um for that movement the the rider's leg aids is your legs aids your legs have to be laying on the horse's side in order to cue that horse fast enough because here's the timing for one now 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 that's how (laughs) fast thumbs are Mm -hmm. so there's no longer any time for us to swing our legs. When when we begin flying changes, we, we swing our leg and we have all this time and we do one change and we make these big swings with our legs. By the time the horse gets to one time changes, the rider's legs are both going to be touching and you basically roll the horse back and forth between your leg and or your seat. Really, really, really finished Grand Prix horses. It's all off your seat. Mm-hmm. Not every horse does that. I would say only two in 10 horses actually have that much talent and that much feel on a rider's seat. But that's our ultimate goal. That would be marked to 10, a horse that can go completely off the seat and we don't even have to roll the leg against the horse. Mm-hmm. But so straightness is essential because if the horse is not completely straight, as he begins to deviate sideways or his neck is to the right or he has a tilt, he will be slightly uneven somewhere in his body, mm. like in his pole, his neck, whatever, which means that the further you go, the bigger the deviation gets. So imagine that you start swerving around on the road and you know the more you swerve, the further off the road you get until you finally roll the car over. <laughs> uh-huh. That's it. So in one time changes, rolling off the road happens like fast. <laughs> <laughs> And you have to do 15 of those changes. So you get to, you get to like six to six or seven change and you had a small deviation, <laughs> which became such a deviation by there that you are so in trouble. Yeah. And, you know, it happens, it happens to everybody. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it, we totally understand because even if we're at intro and we're coming down the center line and forget what we're doing and look down and we look down for a second and the horse takes a jog to the right and then we go, we look up at sea and realize that we're no longer on the center line. Mm-hmm. It, it's the same, you know, for all of us at Grand Prix or at intro, it's the same simple basic problem. The, the more even the horse can be in the reins, absolutely straight through his head and his neck. And we were talking about collection, and I'll just make one comment about changes, which is sort of a really well-known industry secret, <laughs> or it's a well-known not secret, okay. but um, changes really need to be ridden forward. 
And amazingly enough, the canter that we need for canter pirouettes is not the same canter that we use for sequential changes. Sequential change canter is significantly more forward because if it isn't, if I use the collection, the amount of collection that I need to obtain for a canter pirouette, if I began into one-time changes, my one-time changes, at, by the time I got to 15, would be shorter and shorter and mm -hmm. shorter and shorter. And so we actually ride sequential changes forward, mm -hmm. quite forward. And to make them big and expressive, and you get better grades for covering ground, we're actually in a little bit less collection. And we're actually, we turn the corner headed for fours, threes, twos, ones, whichever amount of sequential changes we're looking for, we're actually riding forward because we're desperate to cover ground and show height of step by covering ground. Hmm. So that's kind of an interesting, that's just a sidebar of changes. You also asked me about canter pirouettes. Mm -hmm. And canter pirouettes are amazing because they are the ultimate turn. And the ultimate turn amazingly enough, the horse comes onto a line and he, because a, a canter pirouette is always performed off a straight line. Even mm -hmm. in, even in um, freestyles, you have to have three steps of straight canter prior to a pirouette. You do not have to pass and then pirouette because that allows the horse to escape collection. So always your ass on a straight line and you're cantering along and you show collection real slow and it's a big jump. It's slow, but it's a really uphill canter. And amazingly enough, the amount of flexion that shows to the average person, to an average person looking at this, they're thinking, well, this, this horse really doesn't, it's not bending because they're not looking at and seeing haunches in. They're not seeing the neck to the inside. Those would be marked down. What does happen is that the shoulders flex around and the pole flexes and you have carrying. And now that differential on the hind leg really comes into play. Can the SI really lower? Can the hocks really take weight? And you're really going to see the hind legs go down and bend down and take weight and then keep cantering around in absolutely the same tempo. And although this is the ultimate turn, this is not the turn that shows the most physical bend. Bigger, uh, like 10 meter circles and 8 meter circles actually show more bend, mm -hmm. technical bend, than a canter pirouette. Because by the time you get to the canter pirouette, you're really talking about top line bascule, which is collection. And we mm -hmm. probably have to get to that. Mm -hmm. That was really fun to talk about because I think for me coming in, you know, and, and, you know, I, I watched Charlotte and Vallegro a lot and, yeah. you know, you just watch the, you just watch it and I just watch it and just, it's just amazing. And, you know, I think I'm constantly telling riders that, and I love the training pyramid here because of the idea that it, when we get a chance to talk about these really fun, big harder to achieve, you know, movements, I think it's inspiring so that when you're out there, I love that you related the uh, changes to c coming straight down the center line because it gives me hope that when I'm practicing straight down the center line or something that seems really basic, it's always helpful when I know how it ties together into the upper movements because it, then it does feel like it's all tied together. And that's probably my favorite discovery about dressage. So I'm going to ask you if somebody wants to find you online to ask you more questions. And I know you do teaching in dressage, Western dressage and working equitation. Where could people find you online if they want to ask you some more? They can. And I also teach virtual lessons. So Ooh. they can reach me at idanorrisdressage.com. And my email is idaanorris at gmail.com. And Facebook, Ida Anderson Norris and another Facebook page, Ida Norris Western Dressage. 
Oh, Hopefully good. they Google around out there and can find me. Yeah. Well, we'll also put links to all of those places in the show notes so that if they didn't have a pen while they were out riding or driving or cleaning stalls, they can click over there and uh, they can read the show notes and click on them and find you in any way that's possible. I want to thank you again for joining me and I'm going to have to track you down the next time I head up to Maine because I'm going to have to ride with you sometime. Oh, I can't wait for that. And thank you so much for asking me. It's so much fun. Do, do uh, encourage people to contact me. I love it. This week's dressage training tip is brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, home of the shoulder relief girth at totalsaddlefit.com. With me today for the trainer's tip segment, I have Suzanne Morrissey. I first met Suzanne at the Western Dressage World Show where she gave my pony Willow a jar of horse treats. And then later on when I saw her riding her halflinger mare, Sabrina Sue, I asked her if I could have her half pass (laughs) because it was really good. Suzanne is a USDF L judge, a USDF small R Western Dressage judge, a Canadian Western Dressage judge, a senior halflinger judge, And she has three world titles in Western dressage. So Suzanne, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join me. Well, thank you, Stacey, for having me on your show. It's quite an honor. Well, Suzanne, today I would love to get some advice from you on straightness and working on collection. And it's a really, it's kind of a difficult subject to talk about because it's the top of the training pyramid. So it's, it's very easy for us to go through like every training exercise because how do you, it's like, it's like the end goal is collection. And so it's like, how do we start? So I know we were talking um, when we were preparing for the show and we brought up a lot of different things and you brought up something I've never heard before. So I would love it if you would explain it to me. You called it nesting circles. Now, I'm, I think I have an idea of what it might be, <laughs> but can you tell me what like a nesting circle exercise would be? Can you explain what nesting circles are? Okay, it's circles ridden at the same, starting at the same point. So let's say you start at A and you do a 20 meter circle mm-hmm. and then you do a 10 meter circle and you want to make sure that you're you have a nice tempo and the horse is very forward. Mhm. And so you know it's interesting because it's it's just it's so it's basically the idea of circles inside of circles which we see in some of the tests that we do. So it's interesting to me sometimes when somebody will give me phrasing like they'll say nesting circles and I was like I think I have an idea of what that is but it definitely shows up in different tests. Uh, coming from the reigning world, I always say large circle and then small circle. But the meters is definitely needed there. So so if we're looking at a 20-meter circle and a 10-meter circle, how does that start to lead us into, I know we talked about, you know, in the notes we have like transitions and we have shoulder four and we have shoulder in and we have counter canter. So there's a lot of little subjects I want to touch on. So how would the nesting circles help us with shoulder four or shoulder in the shoulder in which is the mother exercise uh, for collection and the basis of all lateral movement and i start teaching that by doing shoulder four and the bend for a shoulder four is a 15 meter circle Mm -hmm. so you so i take my young horse and i ride a 15 meter circle down at one end of the long side and then I keep that bend and I go straight on the long side. Mm-hmm. And I only do four or five steps and then I'll straighten and and then repeat the exercise. Mm-hmm. And I do and the and shoulder in, it's a ten meter bend. Mm-hmm. And I do that by doing a ten meter circle on the on the end of the long side and then keep that bend out of my 10 meter circle on the long side and then four or five steps shoulder in and then I straighten and then Mm -hmm. I just kind of increase the steps as the horse gets stronger Mm -hmm. and and that makes a lot of sense because I know that I could feel willow getting stronger just from doing that exercise over and over again 
And the fascinating, the thing I'm really fascinated about that we talked about in the, before we started any of the recording was the counter canner. How are you using counter canner to increase collection? Can you, well, first of all, I guess we should probably define what counter canner is. Counter canner is cannering on, on the outside lead. Mm-hmm. Um, and counter canner is extremely helpful in developing greater straightness and collection. And it also can improve the true canner. Mm. That's interesting. Um, when, when you say it can improve the true canner, why, what does that mean? In true canner, the horse is positioned slightly towards the lead leg. Mm-hmm. And the positioning defines the inside of the horse. And in canner, the horse's inside hind leg takes more of his weight. Mm-hmm. As it steps further under his body towards the center of gravity. So it, it helps strengthen the horse's inside leg. Mm-hmm. Is there a particular problem you tend to see when people are doing counter canner? Yeah, it's hard to, to um, straighten this because people want to pull the horse's neck too much. And then the haunch, then you lose the haunches and it becomes a balance issue. The horse can't balance. Mm. Now, so, when you, when you do the counter canter, do you, I've seen it done a couple different ways. Like some people go from regular canter and then kind of like go across the diagonal and go out and turn and go into the counter canter that way. And other people pick up the counter canter you know, from the walk and take it into the corner. Uh, what What do you do or how do you see that those fitting in? I mean, how do I start the canter, counter yep. canter? Mm-hmm. I would start and lead and I go down the long side and, and then maybe do a 10 meter half circle and, and, and ride like a teardrop back to like E mm. and then, and then at S, I would uh, ride a 20-meter half circle and then, you know, change my direction mm-hmm. so that he's back his true lead, we'll call true it, lead. or true camp. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so so kind it's of... not hard. So it's not so hard for him at first. Um, mm-hmm. If you're to ask the horse on the long side to take the outside lead, he might be a little more nervous. Mhm. Mhm. And, and I suppose so you have yeah. to kind of enter the corner. The corners is 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 the tough part. Mm, yes. And that you have to keep the out and I like the counter can cuz it helps the horse <clears throat> engage his outside hind leg and you have to stay focused on that especially around the corners and you have to keep his shoulders in Conches in line, mm-hmm. so it's good straightening exercise also for the rider to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess it has feedback because if you don't if you don't help them, then something's going to happen. They're going to break gait or they're going to change leads somewhere or, or <laughs> some speed up. But you have to have a fairly good start of a good collected canner before you start. Good quality collected canner, I think, before you you start counter canning. That makes sense. Because, I mean, I suppose, I can't remember what level loops show up in the tests. Where Second, where, second level? They, yeah, where they, they go and they do a 10-meter half circle, you know, and then you ride back to, like, E or B, and then yeah. you go straight. And it's a simple change before the turn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because and, you know the turn is the hard part, right? That and that makes sense. So that's the that would be like in the test. That would be the beginning of the counter canter. And I think one the of the first, level. yeah, when and one of the first tests that I was riding when I started doing traditional dressage, I was fascinated with riding loops because you know I come from the reigning world where we're just doing. Uh, the end performance, I'll call it like, we're just doing the, the flying lead changes right there. So I was fascinated that I could ride a loop 
in a dressage test and feel the, to me, it was one of the first times that I really felt how the dressage builds the, the training of the horse as you go up the levels, which is drastically different than reining where you're basically doing the end maneuvers is what we call them then you know, in reining, we're, we're automatically doing the spins and the slides and, and the, and the lead changes. And so it was really fun to feel how riding a loop, I was like, wait a minute, this is something I would do when I was working on teaching a horse to do a flying lead change. And here it is. I get to actually do this while I'm showing the horse. So I definitely love that about dressage. You know, and really, I- so I it just came up with a few more things, you know, um, you know, some of the faults you see. Can can you clarify one thing for me? This this yeah. I have to admit this confuses me at times. So let's say I'm cantering on my right lead and I'm doing a let's say I'm doing a, a, a ten meter circle on my right lead. When I go out into the counter canter, when you say inside or outside I always use it relative to the arena. When you're saying inside or outside leg, are you staying relative to the arena or are you staying relative to, I get confused. Do you know where I'm going with this? Yeah, no, right. No, it's relative to your bend. It's relative to, to my can. bend. So if, I'm, so if I'm cantering to the right, inside is relative to the, the bend to the inside. So then when I'm in the counter canter, then the then it's the opposite. So meaning like my bend is to the outside, so my inside leg is actually my outside leg relative to the arena wall. So your <laughs> so yeah, no, so your you know, your bend, so your inside leg is on the outside of the arena. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Right. And yes. So see that that's where it's so funny because like we just use different phrasing in the other yeah. world that I come from. And so I was following you when you were explaining the counter canner and I was thinking, I definitely know how to counter canner and I'm definitely not good at remembering these different, the different phrasing. So that's so funny how I get tangled up with the inside outside. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up for the day? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do to improve your horse's collection. You know, um, the lat- all the lateral movements, um, and not only on straight lines, you can do them in circles. Mm-hmm. And then the rain back is another one. And then transitions. You know, we should always work on our transitions. And transitions that skip a gate helps collection. Mm-hmm. So what I mean by that is, like, trot, halt, trot or canner walk, canner, Mm -hmm. and make sure they're clean, you know, don't let them have a little, um, you know, they have to step from one to the other, there can't be a little, like, quickening of the tempo, Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, they have to glide, they have to flow one right into the other. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge, I know from firsthand, like, that's a challenge, like, canner walk canner has become one of my favorite transitions, after starting doing dressage and I hadn't done very much of it before that and definitely not with the precision that I'm being asked to now and yet it's become one of my favorite transitions because I can feel all of the things you're talking about yeah you know when I rode with Walter Zettel and I we were working on trot walk transitions and and we must have did 10 of them and then all of a sudden he says that is a great transition and you know i've rode transitions all my life right Mm -hmm. walk transitions and then back to walk and it the light bulb went off i go oh my gosh Mm -hmm. there's a horse with thunder and it flowed and there wasn't any hesitation and and that was a a learning curve for me so it was kind of interesting well i just have to say i'm jealous that you rode with Walter Zettel. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I get the and book. I, you get the book. So, and the then book. one, and one of the things that stuck with me about Walter Zettel is he said, people think that, oh, one day I'm just going to go ride collection. 
And he says, it starts way back in the basics, mm-hmm. way back in the early days of your transitions. Mm-hmm. And, and you're so right. And everything, and, and it's like, Everything builds on top of the other and they intertwine and you can't have one without the other. Exactly. Flexion without straightness. Yeah. Straightness is so important. And then, you you know, you have to have that bridge, you know, where the back comes up and over to the bit and, and you have to have the swing of Mm -hmm. the top line, that suppleness. That's all important for collection. Mm -hmm. So to all points. I just yeah. think it's amazing. And we learn every day. It's every day we learn. Our horses teach us every day. Yes. It's just amazing. And that's why we're stuck. We just keep <laughs> wanting to learn more and more. It is. So we don't lose interest in our riding. That's right. Every horse that I ride, it teaches me something else. And, and every every time I go out there, it's always just amazing to me that, you know, that I've been training for this long and that I really do feel like I'm getting like I'm like I'm getting closer and I read these books about people who are you know masters of disciplines passing away in their 90s and being like I'm so close to figuring it out (laughs) and I'm like I think I get what they mean when they're when they're saying like I'm almost there and they've been doing it their whole life because it does just keep getting it's almost like the more you learn, the more you see, and the more you see, the more you learn, and it just keeps spiraling. And it's, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, so. yeah. It's like I, I finally, my saying is, when I finally figure all this out, I'll be dead, <laughs> <laughs> or I'll be too old to do it anymore. I'm ready to. <laughs> That's funny. Well, yeah. if people want to find you online, um, where would they go to find you? Um, I have a Facebook page, and um, then also I have a uh, Facebook page for my farm. Yeah, and we talked about putting links to those in the show notes um, so that the spelling is correct. Susanna Morrissey yeah. on, on, the, on the one Facebook page. What's the farm name? The Lazy S Equine Learning Center, LLC. Okay. Yeah. Yep, so I'll put links to those in the show notes. Well, thanks again for joining me on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. It's been quite the honor. Well, Total Saddle Fit has the cinch that you've been looking for for your Western dressage saddle. The shoulder relief cinch actually changes the position and angle of the billets to prevent the saddle tree from interfering with the shoulder. The center of the cinch is set forward to sit in the horse's natural girth groove, while the sides of the cinch are cut back to meet the billets two inches behind where the horse's natural girth groove lies. This brings the latigos from angling forward to becoming perpendicular to the ground, which reduces the saddle's tendency to be pulled forward into the shoulders. With horses that have shoulder interference without angled billets, it simply moves the billets back to keep the saddle further away from the shoulders. The secondary benefit to this shape is the cutback at the elbows. This gives more room for elbow movement as well and prevents galls in the elbow area. You can find the shoulder relief cinch at totalsaddlefit.com. That's totalsaddlefit.com. Thanks again to Diney Swanson, Ida Norris, and Suzanne Morrissey for joining me on today's show. In next month's episode, we will be discussing freestyle classes. If you're interested in hearing more from me, I have a podcast where I teach people how to understand, enjoy, and successfully train their own horses. And you can find me in your podcast player by searching Stacy Westfall Horse Podcast. If you'd like to join a community of horse people interested in Western dressage, I have a private Western dressage Facebook group, Western Dressage with Stacy Westfall. You can find our show notes and links to today's guests on the website, Dressage Radio. Dot com. Like us on Facebook, just search for Dressage Radio Show. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Network.com.